The Royal School of Church Music is the internationally renowned charity devoted to the flourishing of church music. We work to support church music and musicians of the present and to build on the great sacred music heritage in the UK and beyond. And we're doing that to create and build a bright future for music and worship for everyone. There are three key things we focus on. Firstly, the school, in our title, reminds us of the vital importance of education. Our comprehensive plan for developing new and exciting projects and products, especially for young people, is now well underway. Secondly, our membership scheme directly supports choirs in churches and schools with practical guides and suggested music. And finally, we are an advocate for church music, working to unlock the power of music for the well-being of all, and to enhance the mission of the church. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this, the final in the third series of RSCM Friday Lunchtime Lectures. My name is Tim, and it gives me great pleasure to be here today with Simon Lowell, who will be talking to us about the changing face of church music, something I'm sure we are all interested in. Simon is well known as a choral director, organist, composer, arranger, and broadcaster. He was organist of Barking Parish Church, Croydon Parish Church, now the Minster, director of music at St Mary's Warwick, uh, to Mary's Warwick before becoming organist and director of music at Sheffield Cathedral and then at Salisbury. Since when he has been freelancing, arranging and conducting BBC uh, programmes including Songs of Praise and broadcasting for Premier Christian Radio. Simon will speak for about 45 minutes and then will answer any questions you may have. Please do use the YouTube chat feed to tell us where you are joining from and to ask your questions. You don't need to wait until the end, so please do add your questions as they occur to you, and I'll put them to Simon at the end, uh, at the end of his lecture. Finally, before we begin, we are delighted to make these lectures free to watch, but they do incur some small costs. So please do consider donating to the RSCM in appreciation. We are a charity and we do rely on the generosity of people such as yourselves to allow us to continue supporting church music and musicians. So, a warm welcome to our lunchtime lectures. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Tim. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be invited to give one of this year's RSCM lunchtime lectures. This year, the topics have been very varied and I don't profess to be quite as cerebral and informative in my approach as my distinguished colleagues. However, having spent a lifetime working in church music, and indeed having had the great privilege of working at just about every different level of church, cathedral and collegiate chapel music, I thought it might be of interest to reminisce 
and reflect on some of the many changes that I have seen over the years in my own career. Much has changed and much of it for the better, but there are always things that can be improved, developed or simply changed. And some things that just need to be left alone and great as the great tradition continues. So where does my story start? The answer is back in Bristol in the mid 1960s. I didn't come directly from a musical family, although I had an uncle who'd been a choral scholar at King's Cambridge and two cousins who were choristers at Westminster Abbey. But as I rarely saw them, I can't say that their music rubbed off on me. Anyway, I remember that I used to enjoy singing as a boy and I joined the choir of St Mary Redcliffe in Bristol under the musical direction of Garth Benson. Those early days were very formative in terms of the inspiration that I received in that great building. I can't begin to tell you about the thrill of hearing the magnificent Harrison and Harrison organ and going to watch Garth play at the end of the service as he sat in that very pit that houses the console to this day. I knew from those heady early days as an eight-year-old that this was what I wanted to do with my life. Let's hear the marvellous instrument now, played by Kevin Bowyer, who was later to become a colleague of mine. sound still still sends shivers down my spine really that was the jig fugue of the bark the church choir in those days was made up of boys from across the city and we probably numbered somewhere around 30 with 18 men in the back row 
We rehearsed twice a week and then sang for two services. If my memory serves me well, Evensong used to have one canticle set in one week and the other sung to chant, and then the next week it reversed, so you sang a whole setting every two weeks. This gave the congregation a chance to join in and wasn't too onerous on the choir with their limited rehearsal time. In those days, many churches had thriving choirs, usually made up of men and boys. Certainly there were a good number in Bristol. And that's one of the great changes that I've seen over the years, as church choirs have dwindled away as the secular world offers so many distractions today, which I regard as a great shame. To this day, Redcliffe still holds a special place in my heart, and it was there that I was first inspired and learnt so much in a short space of time. Much of what I learnt I gleaned from the other boys, who were always very kind and understanding, and it was here that I first understood that this great choral tradition is subconsciously passed from generation to generation without any of us youngsters really realising it. My time at Redcliffe was rather short-lived, some nine months only. Garth Benson told my dad that he thought I should be singing in a cathedral choir, which was a very magnanimous gesture from him. In later life as a parish choirmaster, I realised that I always wanted to keep hold of all the boys that I had recruited and not let them go to cathedrals. Anyway, the result of Garth's kindness found me auditioning for the very distinguished organist of St Paul's Cathedral, Sir John Dykes Bower, or DB as everyone knew him. My audition was very simple. Garth had prepared me a hymn, City of God, to the tune of Richmond, and DB asked me to sing a few scales and clap a few rhythms. And that was it. Interestingly, when I was auditioning boys for my choirs in later years, we found the tests were much more rigorous and taxing. One felt that you had to get it right, though of course you could only really be looking for potential. I realised that I was one of the very last choristers that DB auditioned and accepted into St Paul's Choir after his long 32-year tenure. And I joke that he clearly felt that his judgment had been paired as soon after he accepted me into the choir, he announced his retirement. However, I did manage two terms with him as choir master, and it was a very special time indeed, as he was so kind to the boys in a very avuncular way. His big thing was spotting misprints, and if we spotted one, you got a penny, I think it was. His style of rehearsal was to sit at the piano and gently accompany and point out mistakes, or expect us to, which we acknowledge with a raised hand. He rarely stood up, but he never led from the piano, and this was something I recognised early on, and which helped me greatly in my later career. Too many choir masters in those early days would simply spoon feed the choruses by bashing away at the piano and expecting us to follow. That way, the music was never truly secure, and the choruses never really learned the basics themselves. DB was also a wonderful organist. They say that he never played a wrong note. And I remember the excitement of going to turn his pages after Evensong on the thrilling old console, which was situated in the North Choir organ case. Of course, that was another difference that I remember from that period so long ago. The cathedral organist usually played the organ, and a couple of the vicar's choral would beat from side to side. Today, of course, most choir directors stand in front of the choir, which helps so much with the interpretation of the music, as well as keeping everything very tight. I have a much cherished recording that we made with DB in those early days, and it's fascinating now to hear the sound of the choir in the late 1960s.
gutsy singing there wasn't it. Dini retired at the end of 1967 and at the start of the new year we welcomed Christopher Durnley as our new choir master. Christopher came to St Paul's from Salisbury Cathedral and brought a new energy to the choir with this slightly eccentric charisma and deep knowledge particularly of music from the restoration period. He soon broadened the repertoire of the choir and became greatly loved by us boys with his quirky humour. He encouraged us to learn from each other by mixing the older boys with the younger boys on the music stands. That's a very nostalgic picture there of us standing there. Um, he also used to rehearse us a little more without the piano accompaniment, which helped us to develop our ears. Again, this was a lesson that I was to carry into my own professional career. We rehearsed every morning at school and then every afternoon with the men in the cathedral. In those days, we sang even songs six days a week matins on Saturday and Sunday, a lunchtime service on Fridays, and then the main Eucharist on Sundays. Plus, we were all on a rotor for the voluntary choir, which sang at 6.30 on a Sunday evening. That amounted to at least 11 statutory services a week, never mind all the special services that we had to attend as well. This seems a very marked change from today, a change I think is for the better, in that choruses' workloads today are not nearly as heavy as this anymore. I think we used to go into some services a little under-rehearsed and our school life was organised almost to the minute, so there was very little free time. However, this life really suited me and I had five very happy years at the cathedral where I learned so much musical repertoire and knowledge and was drilled in all those life skills that are so important. Teamwork, punctuality, professionalism, application and always striving for the highest standards. These disciplines are so important, no matter where life takes you. And this is one of the great benefits of being a chorister, either in a cathedral or in a parish church. I sang on Decani in front of senior bass baritone Morris Bevan, who wrote that lovely hymn tune, Corvdair, There's a Whiteness in God's Mercy. I was also a contemporary of the great actor, Simon Russell Beale, although none of his skills rubbed off on me. I was lucky enough to have two terms as head chorister of the choir and two years as first 11 cricket captain. That's something that Sir Alastair Cook did too. But his cricket career seemed to flourish further than mine. After schooling in Bristol, I returned to London to study music at King's College London University and the Guildhall School of Music. I was then lucky enough to spend time as organ scholar back at St Paul's, learning from Christopher Durnley and being most fortunate to hear the great choir training skills and results from Barry Rose. That partnership of expertise between the two men was quite something. Here's the choir back in the late 1970s with Barry and Christopher at the helm.
fabulous singing and fabulous playing. It was an amazing time back then at St Paul's. After university and music college, I knew already that I wanted to carve out a career in church music. And my very first job was as organist and choir master at Barking Parish Church in East London, where I succeeded a charismatic young musician from Blackpool, who later became Lord Mayor of London and president of the Royal College of Organists, Sir Andrew Palmley. The job came with a small flat and an enormous amount of weddings. In fact, in my first year, I played for over 150 weddings. I look back now and realize that this first appointment was an excellent learning curve for me. <clears throat> the choir was about 30 strong and ranged from very young children to a lovely old lady called Elsie, who was 93. The group was full of very strong characters. And the thing this job first taught me was how to deal with people. I've always felt very strongly in my professional life that no matter how good a musician you might or might not be, the ability to deal well with people and to inspire them to give of their best in their music making is an essential quality for church musicians to possess. I'm quite certain that my later cathedral music career was made easier by the lessons that I learned in those early barking days. <coughs> Excuse me. After two years in barking, I was very lucky to move up the church music ladder and become organist at Croydon Parish Church, now Croydon Minster. CPC, as it was fondly known, had an excellent musical tradition and former organists that included Roy Massey and Michael Fleming. I inherited a good choir of boys and men, and the church was also fortunate to have a separate girls choir run very successfully by Mrs. Christine Phillips. Phyllis. I learned a lot from Christine about running a girls choir, and indeed it was for the wedding of a former member that I wrote The Father's Love. It was at Croydon that I had my first real experience of recruiting boys from local schools. Even back in those days when there wasn't so much activity on Sundays as there is now, it was difficult to get boys and the support of their parents too. I remember visiting all the local schools quite regularly, but also having to drive around South London every Sunday morning picking up boys and then delivering them home after mass and repeating the exercise around Evensong. That's something you probably can't do anymore now. It was also whilst I was at Croydon that I started my long association with the RSCN, which at that time was based at Allington Palace, and Lionel Dacus, Martin Howe and Michael Fleming were at the height of their inspirational powers. I remember with great fondness many of the day courses held at Allington, courses covering all aspects of singing and liturgical practice. There was always a great buzz about Addington, and it was a privilege to be part of the educational process there. After five happy years at Croydon, I was very fortunate to be appointed parish director of music for Warwick, which included the marvellous musical tradition at St Mary's Collegiate Church. The church choir must have been probably the best parish choir in England at the time, with 30 boys and 18 men singing choral matins once a month and full Eucharistic and choral settings every Sunday in Saints Days too. I remember Paul Trepty, <coughs> who I succeeded, telling me that I wouldn't find a finer tenor section anywhere in the country. I think the tenors told me that too. Warwick was a team ministry and with three churches of very different churchmanship. This I found a very fascinating dynamic and gave me the opportunity to explore all kinds of different music making. While St Mary's music was very much modelled on a cathedral tradition, St Nicholas had a very thriving choir of its own, but was very much a typical parish choir of mixed ability, whose repertoire was limited, but there was a wonderful keenness in all that they did. Boys and girls, adults, young and old, joined together to make music to the best of their ability. We then also had a church on a newish housing estate that met in the local school hall. Their worship was much more ecumenical and was led by a worship band. There was a wonderful energy amongst everyone who played in this group. We tried our best to practice regularly and I made simple arrangements for those of lesser ability to be able to join in. This is another thing I've always felt rather strongly about in ecumenical worship. Whilst church choirs are very diligent in their weekly practice, it often seems to me that worship groups are almost prepared to play unrehearsed or improvise on the spot. That's fine if you can do it, but I feel these wonderful bands often suffer through the lack of preparation and rehearsal, something that really pays off when you hear an excellent band leading contemporary worship. 
The quality and diversity of the music making in the parish at that time was a very exciting experience for me. And it led me, together with a very visionary rector, to think of ways in which we could further diversify and give more children and families a church music experience. St Mary's Choir had always been for boy choristers, and so it seemed only natural to explore the founding of a girls' choir. So in 1991, with the help of two excellent local schools, St Mary's Choir was formed, the girls' choir. We decided that we would have a midweek evening song on a Wednesday. And if I remember correctly, we started by learning a couple of simple anthems and then adding the Nunc Dimittis of George Dyson's unison setting in C minor. Finally, we added the Magnificat and then sang the same setting for weeks on end. This proved to be very beneficial as it brought confidence and familiarity to the group. After this, there was no looking back with the girls and the choir soon became a very established part of our musical resources. I was delighted to return to Warwick at the end of last year to help celebrate a slightly postponed 30th anniversary of that choir. Here's a recording of the girls at the end of my tenure. Soon after the establishment of the girls' choir, we sought to give more opportunity to adults of every ability across the parish, and a new adult choir, Collegium, was started. The aim here was a more of a communal choral society, and I'm delighted to know that it's still going really strongly and performing all the great works of the choral repertoire. We established a young person's parish orchestra as well that met on Saturday mornings and brought in children from across the town from various schools. This networking helped in general recruitment, as well as bringing more families into church. From my own experience, I would encourage any musicians who work across a number of churches in a team to look at ways in which you can diversify and to expand your music making with all the benefits that it brings. I spent nine very happy years in Warwick, enjoying everything that music there brought, including BBC broadcasts on TV and radio, CD recordings and foreign tours but all good things must come to an end and new challenges sought. So in 1994, I moved north to become master of music at Sheffield Cathedral. Sheffield Cathedral is a former parish church, which became the cathedral back in 1914. 
Musically, it was a very exciting place to work, as Sheffield itself is a very diverse city culturally, with two wonderful universities and a wealth of exciting schools with whom to relate and work. The cathedral had a choir of boys and men drawn from across the city, as well as a fledgling girls' choir of about six members. I remember in the very early days that all the boys supported Sheffield Wednesday, and if they lost on a Saturday, then Palestrina was tough on Sunday. But if a good win had been achieved, then the music making was easy. That was another life lesson for me, which I had to embrace to really get into the mindset of those boys. The cathedral building was a very exciting place to work, as there were numerous spaces in which to explore differing types of liturgy and worship. And it felt good not to be stuck in one area, being very traditional. I had some excellent creative colleagues, and it was fun to have the opportunity to experiment without restraint. We drew the choristers from right across the city, and I spent a lot of time building up networks with different schools and music teachers. Restrictical arrangements were important, <coughs> excuse me, and we established a lunchtime music series on two days a week, which often gave a platform for the city school pupils to perform. It was truly wonderful to get children from so many schools, children of different faiths and backgrounds, who were all drawn together by their love of music. We sang most days of the week, which was quite a tall order. And as the children were often traveling long distances straight from school, we used to feed them before rehearsals. Squeezed into the little kitchen, cooking sausages, chips and beans was a new experience for me, but truly helped the bonding of the choristers. Our girls choir quickly grew and it wasn't long before we were running on about 30 girl choristers drawn right across the city, aged between nine and 11. They made a wonderful, rich and mature sound. And I quickly realized that the younger girls picked up the sound from the older girls. Here they are in action. Hal's Gloucester service, my favourite setting ever, I think. What I most enjoyed about Sheffield was the buzz of such a vibrant city with the cathedral at its heart, the cultural diversity, and the fact that one never felt locked into a centuries-old tradition that you tend to experience in the old foundation cathedrals. There was a real freshness about this approach, and no day was quite the same. It was also quite wonderful to have good relations with so many schools. We tried to make the cathedral a place for everyone. Sadly, my time in Sheffield was short-lived, as in 1997, I was appointed director of music at Salisbury Cathedral, my dream job, and the job I had wanted since being a chorister at St Paul's. Salisbury had obviously led the way with the introduction of girls into the choral foundation. And in those early days, there were a lot of people watching us to see that the boy chorister tradition wasn't affected. Therefore, the two treble lines were kept quite separate and only sang together on the great Christian feast days. We had two separate repertoires, really, which gave the lay vicars a wider variety of music to sing. But I was very aware with the sharing of duties through the week that the familiarity of, in particular, psalmody was something that dwindled. Therefore, psalms had to be much more carefully rehearsed as they came around much more infrequently for each group. It was also very interesting to rehearse the true groups, both of them the same age, to see how they developed. We fundamentally rehearsed them exactly the same, but the approach needed for girls and boys was slightly different, I always found. 
Interesting, after my Sheffield experience with older girls, the corporate sound of the Salisbury girls was much lighter, a quieter sound, as they didn't have the older girls to ape musically. Obviously, singing every day made for wonderful sight reading skills. Of course, a marked change from my time as a chorister was that all the Salisbury choristers had both individual singing lessons and then we worked with the singing teacher as a group. Therefore, much more emphasis was put on technique, something I truly knew little about in my chorister days. When I was a chorister, we just sang. I don't think I was ever told how to sing. There is no doubt this has led to much more high quality singing and blend. I thoroughly applaud the bold steps taken by the Salisbury chapter and Dr. Richard Seal back in 1991 with regard to the introduction of girls into the foundation. It's changed the face of cathedral music as well as strengthening the overall choral scene in the UK. Today, virtually every cathedral has a girl chorister and many now are either adopting or considering adopting mixed top lines. It's also wonderful that by default, by virtue of including girls into what was so long a totally male environment, cathedrals have now also welcomed women into the back row as alto singers. For me, although I love the sound of male countertenors, I think that the blend of male and female alto voices adds a richer, more sonorous and versatile sound to the back row. And you've only got to recognise the highest standards of our professional groups like the 16 and of Tenebrae to realise what effect the early experiences as cathedral or church choristers has now had on both male and female singers. Another highlight of working at Salisbury was the annual Southern Cathedrals Festival, where we joined for three days each July with the choirs of Winchester and Chichester cathedrals. This gave us the opportunity to come together and perform bigger works with orchestras, as well as singing services at our fellow cathedrals. The festival was always rooted in the liturgy and the centrepiece was the Festival Eucharist, when the three choirs often used to sing all the big French settings of the Mass. It truly was a sound to behold. I had the great fortune to travel extensively with the Salisbury Choir, the USA, South Africa and Brazil being particular highlights, although tours always had to happen in the holidays, so you often had very little break between one term and the next. <clears throat> it was also quite exhausting running both choirs. I'm very encouraged that today most cathedrals with two treble lines have different directors. A very sensible move in my opinion. In 2005, I decided uh, to leave the hallowed spaces of the close, full of retired admirals and ex-prime ministers. I wanted to try new challenges and experience and move more into the media, which has always interested me. However, just as I was planning my farewell, I got a call to ask whether I could step in as acting director of chapel music at Jesus College in Cambridge, when Dan Hyde left to go to Magdalen College in Oxford. This was a very unexpected step for me, but I felt that as I had experienced every other type of church music, it would be interesting to work in a Cambridge chapel for a while. I do remember the Dean of Chapel telling me right at the start of my tenure that we could really do whatever we liked as long as Sunday Evensong didn't exceed an hour as the fellows looked forward to their glass of wine before high table. That was a lesson I learned. The musical foundation at Jesus was very interesting with a boys choir drawn from across the city and then a choir of undergraduate and graduate students drawn predominantly from Jesus College, although we had a number of students from other colleges too. What I found so refreshing about working with the students was their great willingness to learn and the fact that there was so much of the repertoire that they were singing for the first time and therefore there was a freshness to their approach and they were always eager to find new pieces to explore. I particularly remember teaching Howell's great masterpiece, Take Him Earth for Cherishing, and watching the profound effect the piece had on the students who hadn't encountered it before. Since those days, my freelance work has taken up much of my time, including leading lots of courses at the RSCM, both here and in the USA. My church music life too has come full circle since 2010, I've been director of music at Swanage Parish Church in Dorset, working with a lovely group of amateur singers who give of their best every week has been very fulfilling and it feels good to be able to give back a little of the wonderful riches that I've experienced in my own varied church music career. 
I realize that today so many things are different from when I started out all those years ago. There are so many distractions in today's world that it's very hard to get people to commit to regular singing in church, and so many choirs have sadly disappeared. Hymn singing in schools is a thing of the past too. So church musicians have got to be much more creative today in their approach to the way they run the choirs and how they recruit new um, choristers. Long ago for me are those days of trekking around schools recruiting children. Can't do that anymore. I recognise too that many adults don't want a regular commitment to singing. But for many, choral even song still has a magical appeal. So one of my innovations in Swanage is to have a monthly come and sing even song. We provide the music, we meet at four o'clock to rehearse, and most crucially, we have tea and cake before we sing. It's become very popular and brought lots of new faces into church. I've expanded it now by, invi by inviting guest directors to lead and impart their wisdom. <laughs> I hope that my reminiscing hasn't been too self-indulgent. I feel very privileged indeed to have worked at so many different levels of church music. I've no idea how many choruses have come under my influence, but I do know that I've never stopped learning from all the singers and organists that I encounter. You're never too old to learn and to try and improve yourself. As you will have realised, much has changed in the 50 years that I've been involved with church music and the world has changed too, as our world has become so much more secular and there are now so many other distractions to take away from church choirs. I'm saddened that so many choirs have disappeared and once they've gone, it's very difficult to get them back. A bigger gulf has developed, I think, between our top cathedral choirs and choirs at parish level. And of course, the impact of the pandemic is still being felt in so many choirs. But I continue to be optimistic about the future and the challenges that lie ahead. Church music in the UK is still the envy of the world and our top choirs are as excellent as they have ever been. It's also so wonderful to see so many more women being involved in every aspect of church music, not just as choristers or as lay clerks, but also as musical directors and composers as well. Children may not be so familiar with the hymns in the way that they once were, and parents may be not so keen to come and join their children in church. So these are challenges too. And there are many challenges that lie ahead but I see a new generation of very talented and enthusiastic church music musicians sorry, coming through. And that feels very good to me. So I feel very positive about the future. Simon, thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. I'm sure our listeners will have thoroughly enjoyed it and will have lots of questions to ask, won't you? Uh, but before we go to the Q&As, um, here is a very short message from the RSCM's director, Hugh Morris. I really hope you've enjoyed the lecture and will keep watching to join the Q&A session. The RSCM is very much alive and active, but we are an independently funded charity and we need your support. There are real costs involved and we need people like you to put their hands into their pockets to help. Please show your appreciation for today's lecture, either by donating, be that by text or online, or by becoming a friend or a member. All the details can be found on our website, rscm.org.uk. Thank you. And now it's question time. Well, before we uh, uh, launch into questions, and while you're uh, racking your brains for any other questions you'd like to put to Simon, I'll take this opportunity to let you know that although there is, this is the last of the third series of lectures, we have already started to look at the next series. So do please keep an eye out on our website and Facebook page for details later on in the year. And also, it's not too late to book for our members' conference at Rugby School tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. And uh, if you still want to buy a ticket, hop over to our website for more information after this lecture. So uh, now on to the questions. Um, we have one from Michael Grave. Um, 
come, uh, sorry, uh, uh, there it is. Uh, come and sing even song. Uh, sounds good. What sort of music do you use, and does it affect the congregation as well? Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a very good exercise, actually. What sort of music do we use? We um, we tend to stick to the same responses every time. So Smith four part G major responses, and we've got a selection of uh, canticle settings. You know. The, the most popular, the Stanford and C's, the Stanford and B flats, Brewer and D, Wood and D type things. Um, we always do an intro and an anthem as well. And, and I always try and make sure there's something which is new that will challenge people. But I think you've got to get the balance right, the level, because if people come along, they need to know some of the music, but they, they want to learn a little bit. But I think if it's too difficult, then, um, you know, it puts them off. Um, does it affect the congregation? Uh, yes, it does in terms of um, as we've had extra people coming in, we've had more people joining in the congregation as well. So the whole thing has grown um, by doing this exercise. Um, and it's just so easy to do. You know, you've just got to prepare a little bit. And as I, as I said in my lecture, we, 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 uh, we give the music out. So you, you, you sort of put all the piles of music out. You literally hand it to people. Here you go. Sit down and, uh, and off you go. And, and, and as I said, the other key thing is the tea and cake. I know um, singing teachers would tell you you shouldn't be eating cake before even song, but boy, that's the best bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard of, uh, of, of somewhere, I think it's in East London, where um, they do a come and sing even song with curry afterwards, which oh, strikes me as being yeah. a very good idea. <laughs> very, very good idea. Yeah. Uh, John Woodhouse, one of our regulars, uh, how do we get children to actually hear organs and choirs live? We need to do this if our tradition is to be to be maintained. Hello, John. I remember you from a long time ago. Um, a good question, a very good question. Um, I, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Um, it, it is very important that we, we get uh, the kids to, to uh, listen to choirs and organs. I mean, one of the things that I've done over the years be it in the cathedrals or at the churches, is to try and uh, run some workshops, perhaps um, <clears throat> in relation with local schools, bring the children in uh, to the cathedral. I mean, at Salisbury, we used to do this quite a lot, um, <clears throat> do all sorts of pageants and um, processions, goodness knows what, and, and play the organ to them as well. I've never seen children so fascinated as just sitting there and playing the lowest notes of the organ and the highest notes of the organ and the loud, loudest and the softest. Um, and then I suppose also, you know, if we can get uh, parents to bring their, their children to a service, even if they're not wanting to be members of the choir, but just to hear the choir as well. Um, but, it, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge to this day. And, you know, I'm just very aware, as I said, um, people, there are so many um, diversions on a Sunday, for example, that, that a lot of children sadly don't want to come to church. Mm. And I, I guess it's not really helped with uh, songs of praise now being sort of just after lunch on a Sunday rather than <laughs> tea time. Well, uh, yeah, where, you know. yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> uh, a couple of questions from me. Um, uh, what was the piece of music that the girls' choir at Warwick sang? I, it, it sort of rang a oh, bell with me. Richard, Richard, dear, dear, um, <clears throat> lovely Richard Shepherd, Prayer for a New Mother. Prayer for a New of Mother. Of course it was, yes. What a beautiful yeah. piece, I know. Lovely what piece, a tunesmith yes. Richard was. Oh, yeah. Yes, a great loss to us all. Um, did, did you, uh, singing in St Paul's, uh, did you... Uh, how did you find singing uh, with the acoustic? Because there's extremely long uh, resonance in the building, isn't there? Did you? Because um, and it, from a listener's point of view, it's very difficult to find a good place to listen to the choir without <laughs> the acoustics becoming, uh, you know, over uh, over overpowering. Yeah. Um, was it like that to be to, to, to be singing you know, in it? Do you know? I mean, that's a good question. Do you know? I. I you know, I, I've, I've worked there a few times as an adult sort of directing choirs, and I think I've been much more mindful of the acoustic then than when, when I was a chorister. I think when I was a chorister, we just almost sort of took it for granted. I, you know, I mean, it's very exciting um, <clears throat> when you're singing something, particularly in rehearsal, and, and the choir master stops and you can hear it sort of reverberating around under the dome. Um, I guess a lot of stuff that we sang, we took at a fairly sort of measured pace. 
obviously mm. the choir director's new perhaps it's a question you should ask Barry Rose more about or, or Andrew, <laughs> Carl, Andrew Carwood indeed but um you know it, I, I don't think I don't think we were very aware of it we just you know it was where we worked we just got on mm -hmm. with it really just got on with it. yeah 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 yeah, I remember talking to uh, Philip Ledger about uh, you know, working at, at King's, and uh, he he felt he was very much, um, you know, the acoustic had to be respected, and if you tried yeah. doing things too fast, it, it, it things quite no, would no, very absolutely. easily unravel. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's a difficult it's building to work in, St Paul's certainly. Hmm. Uh, yeah, very expensive too. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the the uh, mixed cathedral choirs, uh, the top mm -hmm. line becoming mixed more and more yeah. now, and I think it's yeah. I, I believe it's due to uh, you know the government saying that if you've got if you've got boys and girls at the at the choir school, then you are you know you have to have you have to give them equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know there are critics of uh, girls in choirs at all, uh, let alone mixing them with the boys. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, they say that the trebles will be adversely affected. Um, do you have a view on this? Uh, yeah, well, I do. I mean, I, 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 as I say, when I started at Salisbury, um, there was a very strong campaign against girls' choirs, which we obviously had to defend. Um, and we did keep the choir, the two, two sets of choruses, very separate. Um, and I remember as a as a sort of parish church chorister thinking, you know, dare I say this, that being a, a choir boy, you know, and dress up in a cassock and everything, some of your peer groups who didn't get the whole church music thing sort of saw, saw it as a bit of a sort of sissy thing to do. And therefore, if you brought girls in as well, I think there was more pressure on the boys not to sing. But, you know, when, when it's sort of organised in, in cathedrals now, I mean, I just think it's the most wonderful thing because... Um, it gives you more resources if you've got two choirs. You can give one lot of kids a weekend off, or you can be doing you can be doing some outreach with one group while the other group is singing um, and mixing them together. I mean, it is what it is today, and and you know, uh, parity has been achieved. I know a lot of cathedrals now tend to sort of broadcast with the year eight and year seven boys and girls together, which is fine. I don't have a problem with that at all. I think the only problem I have is if if we did see completely the demise of boys' choirs. But you've only got to look around the cathedrals, and still there are a lot of excellent boy boys' groups. So you know, I'm I'm not too worried. And I think all of those of us who did or who still do run cathedral choirs are very mindful of that. And there's no way, you know, I used to get a little bit irked when people used to say to us, you know, your the, the boys' tradition is getting damaged. Well, no, we were building on a tradition and widening it, and there was no way I was ever going to let that that go. You know, the boy, but boys singing together, it's a very special sound. But then it is with yeah. girls too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, of course, you know, at Salisbury, they ha I, I think it's quite an advantage that, uh, that, that you know, that the boys have... Um, you know, they're, they're not singing every 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 day. Um, you know, it gives them time. Uh, certainly, when I was uh, when I was a, a treble, um, quite a number of my colleagues got you know nodules on the yeah. chords and what have yeah. you. And uh, because we were singing every single day, and yeah. uh, you know that yeah, it's a tall order. That really, it is a tall order. It yeah. really is a very difficult thing for uh, you know for 10, 11 year olds to be doing. It's um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 as I say, I mean, I look back at my time, and and you know, we, we, it was almost ridiculous the amount of services we sang, but, mm. but it was the norm at the time, and you, you didn't question it. It was just, no. just what you did, really. Yeah. <laughs> and and of course, when when I was a when I was a chorister, the choir school was literally thirty eight boys. Everyone who went to the school was in the choir. So yeah. you know. Yeah, it, it, everything revolved around the music. I mean, it still does to an extent, but but these days there's there's um, an input. You know, you, you have to be aware of of the whole school and what the rest of the kids are doing as well, and let the choruses be integrated into that as well. Yeah, so it's a yeah. little bit difficult. Going back to uh, the original, uh, the the first music clip they have, which was the organ at uh, St Mary Redcliffe. Um, uh, 
I, I know a number of organists who who absolutely rave about the Harrison Harrison organ there, and I've heard it. It, it is a, a glorious sound. Mm. Uh, what what um, what is it about that organ that uh, that may make you know? famous organists want to record there and, uh, and yeah yeah I, I it's a good question i mean it's just so very exciting do you know i remember i, I remember when i was at salisbury I, I gave a couple of recitals there and um i remember coming back to salisbury and of course the father willis just one of the great organs of all time and i, I the, the the father willis if this makes sense it sort of felt a little bit feminine and gentle compared to the sort of <laughs> I mean this nicely, the sort of brutality of the Edwardian sort of big Harrison and Harrison. It's just very fiery, very exciting. I mean, so many wonderful sounds on the Redcliffe organ. Um, mm. And actually, I, I use the word pit where, where the console is. That was always terribly exciting, the fact that you're sunk down into the floor a little bit. Um, and, and so what, and, and what used to happen at the end of the service, it might, well, Andrew Kirk would say, I don't know, but... Um, we used to go and stand round the, the side of the pit when Garth played the voluntary at the end. And, you know, people used to come from the congregation. He, he'd have a great crowd of people all standing <laughs> around. And it was terribly yeah. exciting to watch as well as to yeah. listen. Yeah. And when you processed yes. out, yes. you had some of the pedal pipes right next to you. Um, but it, it's, it's a very versatile instrument. And, it, I mean, that jig fugue, I mean, Kevin purposely did a, a, a recording of Edwardian Bach music. He, his idea was <laughs> if Bach had come along, this is probably how he would have played it at Redcliffe, not on three flutes. Um, <laughs> and so it was rather exciting. Um, but, but, but you know, you could play any, any genre of music on it too. So, I mean, it's a very special mm. instrument, it really is. Yeah. I don't know if, if, you've, if you've come across the, uh, the CD of Johnny Vaughan playing Wagner on it, uh, which oh, no, is I really haven't. exciting. Really? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. I mean, you can just play anything on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think there are no further questions. So thank you again, Simon, for giving your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and it's been a really insightful hour, and uh, uh, I hope uh, you at home have all enjoyed it. Uh, finally, I'd like to remind viewers that you can access uh, on our website using the links on the YouTube page. Uh, to donate or to find out about membership of the RSCM. As I said earlier, we are delighted to make these lectures free to watch, um, but they do incur some small costs. So please do consider donating to the RSCM in appreciation. And remember to keep an eye out for the next series of the RSCM lunchtime lectures. And the video at the end now is the RSCM's platinum anthem In Our Service by Thomas Hewitt Jones. Now, we want as many churches and choirs to join in um, in singing this wonderful anthem um, in recognition of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, so do please visit the RSEM web shop. That's www.rsemshop.com for more information. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye.